Good morning, everyone. Glad to have everyone here. Glad to have everyone here on time. <laughs> I hope you uh, enjoyed one hour less of sleep last night. <laughs> the sunrise was beautiful driving in this morning, though. Just thanking God for that as uh, we were coming in. Let's go ahead and open our service. Um, Lord, we do thank you for today, for this chance that we have to sing our praises to you, sing our prayers to you. Um, Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand for these opening songs. our seats and we got a quick video introducing our upcoming marriage seminar.
the end of their lives look back at a fork in the road where they headed toward isolation and a loss of hope. The last two generations of my family, there have been 25 marriages and 22 divorces. And what does it do to children when they see the image of that being ripped apart? What the cross promises in marriage is fresh starts and new beginnings. Fresh starts and new beginnings. That's what the cross promises all of us in our lives and with our homes, our marriages, our families. We do have, and you'll notice it on page two of your bulletin, we do have an Art of Marriage seminar coming up here soon, April 20th and the 21st. We are taking names now of people who want to attend. Leading our seminar will be David Derry from Family Life Ministries. And David is with us this morning. David, if you'd come on up to the platform and share a little bit of what we can expect. Not only is David here, but his wife, Laurel, their daughter, Rose, and their son, John, are gracing our service today. All right, David, we have a seminar, The Art of Marriage, Getting to the Heart of God's Design, planned here on Friday night, the 20th, and Saturday, the 21st of April. What can we expect? Thanks, Pastor Joel. Uh, good to be with you guys this morning. Uh, we are excited to be with you. The church has supported our ministry for several years, which we're grateful for, uh, and we are excited to be with you for this Art of Marriage conference. Actually, I will be here helping to facilitate the weekend. My wife and I have done 14 of these events at different churches around Northeast Ohio, but she was already scheduled uh, to share at a women's retreat with Family Life down in Asheville, North Carolina, and lead a pastor breakout, a pastor's wives breakout session at the women's retreat when this was scheduled. So I'm gonna be here to facilitate it without her for the first time. But it is a video-based marriage conference. The images that you saw flashing on the screen there in the video are all part of the uh, content that we'll be watching. So it's a very engaging six session video uh, event. I'll be facilitating that, walking you through the weekend, explaining the couples projects that you'll be working on and so forth. So I'm excited about that. Um, one thing that people often will mistake is they think that a marriage event like this is for couples who are really struggling or who are in crisis. So if you go back to the table and sign up, everybody's going to say, oh, they must be having problems in their marriage. And I want to assure you that's not the case. This event is for every married couple or pre-married couples who are engaged to be married. It'll be very beneficial, very enjoyable uh, for all of you uh, to be a part of that. And also, there's no sharing, like we don't circle up and ask you to discuss, like, hey, get with several other couples and share, you know, three things that are wrong in your marriage. We're not going to do that that weekend. It's just you and your spouse that are there together, watching the sessions, walking through those, doing the projects. So I do want to say one thing is that there are, if you're in here and you're married this morning, you're in one of three groups. So I'll tell you the three groups. I'll let you identify which one you think you're in, and then I'll tell you, based on that group, why you should come to this event. So some of you in here this morning would say, our marriage is just fine. We don't need to come because our marriage is fine. Others of you would say, well, we've got a few issues, but our issues aren't that bad, so we don't need to come. And then there may be some of you here this morning that are in every church kind of hiding. You don't want anybody to know who you are, that your marriage is really in a terrible state. Uh, it's really falling apart, and you're barely holding on by a thread. And so you would say this morning, I don't think it would help us to sign up because I don't think anything can help our marriage at this point. It's that bad. So those of you here this morning that say our marriage is fine, we don't need to come, I would tell you that my wife and I went to a Weekend to Remember event with Family Life seven years ago, and our marriage was fine, or so we thought when we went, but we learned and heard a few things that we could apply that made it even better. So if your marriage is doing fine this morning, we're great, we're glad, we rejoice with you that it's fine. We hope that you'll come, invest in it, learn some things that you can do better, or even encourage other couples after you come to see how you can help them in their marriage. Those of you who say, well, we've got a few issues, but it's not that bad, I don't think we need to come, I always ask couples in that group, how bad does it have to be before you would invest and try to do something to help out with those small issues before they get big? And then if you're here this morning and you say, boy, our marriage is, is just really bad. I don't think anything could help us. It's that broken. I would tell you that we talk with couples all the time and they come to events just like this who are in that condition 
and God brings reconciliation and restoration into marriages that just doesn't seem like there's any hope. Uh, there is hope through Christ, and we hope that you'll sign up and come and enjoy this weekend with us as well. So after the service, I'll be out at the table uh, in the north hallway there. If you have questions or would like to stop by and talk to us or sign up, uh, we'll be out there, and we'll look forward to talking with you. Thanks. David, thank you very much. We know that Family Life Ministries is very reputable, and we know that you and Laurel are people of integrity who will bring that integrity and that knowledge to our church. I want to encourage you to stop by the table, have your questions answered, get information, and sign up for this seminar April 20th and the 21st. Go ahead and stand for these next two songs. came for criminals and every Pharisee. You came for hypocrites, even one like me. You carried sin and shame, the guilt of every man, the weight of all I've done. Nailed into your hand. Oh, your love bled for me. Oh, your blood in crimson streams. Oh, your death is hell's defeat. A cross. Is my victory. Oh, your amazing grace. Oh, your amazing grace. I've seen and tasted it. It's running through my veins. I can't escape its grip. In you my soul is safe, you cover everything, oh your love bled for me, oh your blood in crimson streams, oh your death is hell's defeat, across takes away our sin, who takes away our sin. The Holy Lamb of God makes us alive again, makes us alive again. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away our sin, who takes away is my victory.
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound, entrenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still in all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. On the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. days that we will sing your praise. Oh, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and grab our seats. If you got a bulletin today, you'll notice in the bulletin a couple of inserts. The first one regards a messianic dinner. Every alternate year, we like to do a Passover meal. 
Now, this is a full course meal, by the way, as well as observing the Passover the way Jesus observed it, the way the Jewish people have observed it for centuries and remain observing it today. So this will be a Seder dinner, a Passover dinner. Fred Bennett, missionary to the Jewish people, will be present to conduct it for us. And information is available from Rick Miller out in the North Hallway. Again, the North Hallway where the tables are set up. Get information and sign up for our Messianic Passover dinner. If you are a guest this morning, we especially welcome you. We're pleased that you have come to worship the living God with us here. Yes, he is alive. And through the Lord Jesus Christ, his son and our Savior, you can know him. We have a gift for you, which is a very nice ballpoint pen with a rubber tip for your smartphone. It's available in the lobby as you leave. Attached to the pin will be a card. If you want more information on our church, just fill out the card and leave it on the table. We'll collect it after the service, and we will send you that information in the mail. I notice a second insert, and it's a colorful one, advertising the story, and I see a cross erected here in the corner, and I'm going to ask Matt, Come and tell us what this is all about, would you please? Yes, uh, next Sunday, uh, as well as the following Friday, the 23rd, the Creative Arts Ministry will be presenting our Easter concert, The Story. Um, it's a very uh, compelling, interactive presentation that uh, tells goes from the beginning of time of creation through uh, the fall of man, through um, uh, uh, Jesus' death and resurrection, as well as then the glorious coming, uh, telling the full story of uh, the Bible in a condensed hour-long presentation. And we had our first rehearsal yesterday, and so uh, everyone is pretty tired, I'm sure. <laughs> but it was a great time having that, the full orchestra and choir and everything. So I hope uh, that it will be a, an event that you can plan on attending, um, and especially the following Friday evening, uh, being an opportunity to bring guests and friends that may attend elsewhere to church, but give them an opportunity to uh, participate. Matt, thank you very much. Now, keep in mind, next Sunday is a very special service. Our creative arts department, the choir, and those involved in creative arts will be presenting the story. This is a sermon through music, a sermon in song and drama. So it will break the, the uh, traditional presentation of the word through preaching. Some like that, some don't, but I can tell you that the change in the routine is good. And I know that if you come and invite friends with you, that they will enjoy this presentation. And so keep that in mind and invite those people with you who don't normally attend church. And they'll be attracted by the unusual nature of the service next Sunday and the presentation of the gospel through song will be given and it's a wonderful opportunity for you to invite people who otherwise would not go to church. Speaking of going to church, I am grateful as a pastor for every friend I have in ministry. Every other pastor. I pray for the other churches around here and for my friends who are pastors and who preach God's word faithfully week after week, month after month, year after year. They are precious to me as friends, as counselors. They are not the competition. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's why I pray for them, and I know many of them pray for our church and for me as well. One such friend is gracing our service this morning, and I want to acknowledge his presence, taking a break from the the Liberty Bible Church in Atwater, which is about nine or ten miles north of us here, is Paul Phillips with his wife, Patty. Paul, will you stand so everyone can see who you are and his wife, Patty. Thank you for your faithful service to Christ. The offering that we received this morning is for the ministry God has given us together here at the chapel in Marlboro. Thank you for your faithfulness in the giving of tithes and of offerings. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, today we are grateful for the opportunity to be here, to be challenged by Pastor Davies from your word, because it is a challenge. 
Every time I hear a sermon or read a sermon, I am challenged to be a better person, to submit further to the Lordship of Jesus, to allow the Holy Spirit to control me through the Word of God, which is truth, God's truth for my life and for our world and our time. I pray that as we give today, your blessing will be upon these gifts and those who give them. And I ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Thank you for your gift this morning. Some glad morning when this type is o'er, I fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. job thank you is there anyone here this morning who has never heard that song before I'll fly away so you've all heard it good I'm seeing young people leave am I supposed to ask the jammers to leave at this time I guess they're going to leave whether I ask them to or not I good morning everyone I'd like to ask you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. When you get there, if you would, place your bulletin or something there, then set it to the side for just a couple minutes uh, and we'll get to it. A few, few years ago, an attorney by the name of Bruce Bickle co-authored a book by the name I Can't See God Because I'm in the Way. And in the introduction to the book, 
Bruce makes a number of comments concerning his spiritual activity kinds of things that he's involved in. Or he says that he attends church on a regular basis. He's a member of the church board. He leads a small group study. It's fairly regular in his devotions every day. He prays before meals. He ties his income. And he has acknowledged his faith to his neighbors. Well, that's a pretty good list. I don't know what your list would look like and whether it would be as big as maybe Bruce's, but anyway, Bruce goes on in the introduction and he makes this statement. He says, by outwardly objective standards, I've got my spiritual life together. But on the inside, the part that only God and I know about, things aren't always so great. Oh, they aren't bad. In fact, most of the time, my faith life is good. But it's not awesome. Like many Christians, I was enthusiastic about my faith immediately following my conversion. But somewhere along the line, my relationship with Christ skidded into a religious rut. I didn't actually get lazy because I'm a doer for Christ. But I lost my passion for Christ. My love for him was constant. But my passion for him waned. That's very transparent. Talking with some people after the, the first service and talking with Rick over here, he talked about pride and how we always like to appear all together. Always like to appear like we have no problems. And Bruce is very transparent here. Bottom line, Bruce is saying he's not where he used to be. And I think maybe we need to give some thought to that this morning concerning our own life and answer that question. Are, are we where we used to be with Christ? Are we where we need to be? Are we where the Lord wants us to be? Some may say yes, I... I was talking with a friend of mine recently. I've known this person since high school years, and we started talking about the past. I think that's maybe a, a, a sign that you're old. You talk about the past. And we were talking about when we came to Christ and what it was like when we first came to him talked about what we did. We talked about how excited we were once we received Jesus Christ as our Savior. Talked about some of the things that we did. There were Youth for Christ clubs. There were quiz groups, witnessing teams, Bible studies, rallies. It was such an exciting time. I tell you, we were excited. I, I we were thrilled to be followers of Jesus Christ. And as we were talking to one another, then we started naming some names. If you talk about the past, you're going to end up talking about people because they were a part of all of that and part of our lives and what we were doing. And so we started talking about not gossiping. We weren't. We said, do you remember? Do you, do you remember? You remember when he came to Christ, how excited he was and, and the concern that he had for other people who didn't know Christ. He wanted to share about the Lord Jesus with everyone he came into contact with. He just had this heavy burden for people who didn't know Christ. And remember how sometimes he'd even pretend like he was Billy Graham and, and he was standing there like he was preaching. And, but not now. 
Do you remember? Do you remember? You remember how she impacted our life? Oh, what an impact she had. She just, she sparkled for Jesus Christ. She was so enthusiastic, but, but not now. You remember, remember him. You remember how he loved the word of God. He had memorized the word of God. He was always studying the word of God. And he, but not now. You remember? You remember? One after another, we came up with names of people who aren't what they used to be. These are people we looked up to. These were people who had a passion for Jesus Christ. We used to use the terminology that they were really on fire for Jesus Christ. It's like they had a fire in their gut and they couldn't hold it back. They had to share about Jesus. These were the leaders. These were the people who were going to make a difference in our world. But something changed. They didn't lose their salvation. You can't do that. If you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you become a part of the family of God, if you are born again, born from above, if you invite Christ to come into your heart, you can't lose that salvation. But they lost something. Before we look at 2 Samuel chapter 11, a little bit of background here. Remember David of the Old Testament. David the shepherd boy. What a tender young man he seems to have been. Tended the sheep. There was a day, there was a night when a lion and a bear came to attack the sheep and he killed them. 1 Samuel chapter 17. He was tender, but he was tough. David. David, 11, 12, 13 years of age. Samuel came along and anointed David king. Josephus, Jewish historian, says he was even younger than that. Josephus says he was 10 years old. He was anointed king. He would lead the nation politically. He'd lead the nation spiritually. David, the rosy-cheeked young boy, 15, 16, 17 years old, who fought Goliath. Some say that he was even younger than that. Here's the army of Israel. Here's the army of the Philistines along with Goliath. And David stepped out and he fought Goliath. No one else would. He did. And he killed the champion of the Philistines. A kid. But oh, how he loved the Lord. How he loved to sit at night when he was tending the sheep and just look up and see the stars and the moon and the wonder of it all. Those lights in the sky. And the great God who created it all. He loved to sing about the Lord. He'd sing to himself. He'd sing to others. He, he had a passion. David was so excited about the Lord. Joy filled his heart. Joy filled his life. Every morning he got up, it was a new day, new opportunity to serve the Lord, a new opportunity to worship him. What excitement, what a thrill to be able to do that. But when we come to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, things have changed. We read in the word of God, and it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, 
that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. David's about 50 years old now. No longer the young kid. A lot of things have happened over the years. David's not what he used to be. He's not what he used to be physically. He's not what he used to be mentally. He's not what he used to be spiritually. I read an article not long ago. I don't recall even how I came across the article. It was an article about the Korean War. There was a battle that was fought, the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir. According to the history records, there was only one other battle during the Korean War where there were more fatalities, and that was the Battle of the Busan Perimeter. But the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir, there were 14,000 American casualties in that battle, 14,000. Half of those casualties were caused by combat. Half of those casualties were caused by the weather. It was 35 degrees below zero when the troops were fighting. It was horrible. The casualties of the weather. Well, that wouldn't happen during the Old Testament. Because the political leaders tried to avoid the rains of the winter in the harvest of the fall. It was the time when kings went to war. Mark it on your calendar. Spring is coming. Gather the troops. If you're going to go to war, that's the time to do it may seem strange to us, but that's what they did. Verse 1 tells us something else. It tells us that the kings or the political leaders, they went to war too. They usually went. They frequently went. You see, it wasn't just simply a matter of saying to all of those who are 20 years old and younger, Listen, I'm the political leader, and I want to fight against this nation over here, so all of you get together, and I want you to go to war. That's not the way it worked. The political leaders went out in front. They not only went to the war, they went in front. I don't know when that all changed, but think of what a different world we'd have today if the political leaders led the march. Remember in 1 Samuel chapter 17, again, here was Israel, here were the Philistines, and, and the word of God makes it clear that King Saul was there. That's what kings did. But not David. Not this year. The word of God doesn't give us a reason. But David decided to stay behind in Jerusalem. Maybe he was going through his midlife crisis. I don't, I don't know. I... But according to verse 2, it says, And it came to pass in an evening time, or just evening if you have NIV or NASB, that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. The word evening tide in the Hebrew, it means dusk. David went to bed early. The sun had just set, I don't know. 
There was nothing to do. There was no one handy to talk to. I don't know. But he went to bed and he couldn't sleep. Was he thinking about the war that was going on? Was he thinking about the troops? Was he wondering, are we winning? Are we losing? What's going to happen? I don't know. Do you have those nights when you can't sleep? The nights when you just can't turn it off? You can't get comfortable. You toss, you turn. You adjust your my pillow, and it just, it, you just can't sleep. That's the way it was with David. So he got up, and he went up to the roof. Well, that sounds strange, too. But we need to keep in mind that the roofs back then were flat. Go to Israel today, you'll still find a lot of flat roofs. In the Old Testament, people would sometimes gather together on the flat roof. Or if it was a hot day, hot night, you would go up there when the sun had gone down. It'd be cooler up there on the flat roof. And so David had gone up on the flat roof of his house, the palace. And he started walking around. And as he began looking out over the city, no doubt there's a fire being built over here and there and there and there. And and the soft light from all the fires must have created a beautiful picture as he looked out over Jerusalem. But he's looking and he's looking and as he's doing that, he looked down and he saw a woman was bathing. And she must have been in the near proximity. And he didn't look away. He didn't say, oh, I shouldn't be looking at that. I, that's wrong. That's, I. He kept looking. And he kept looking. Now, you know what happened. In verse 3, he sent a messenger Find out who that woman is. Messenger went, came back, said, she's Bathsheba, she's the wife of Uriah, one of your officers. Her husband is off in battle. Verse 4 says he sent a messenger and said, get her and bring her here. And he spent the night with her. And verse 5 says, and she was pregnant. I think it's kind of interesting that you have four verses there. Four verses that kind of describe the sin of David in the rest of the chapter. Is really about how he tried to cover it all up. Four verses, the sin, and the rest. Like people today, when you sin, you want to cover it up. You don't want anyone to know. Again, it's that pride thing. And, and David was going to be unsuccessful. His first idea was, let's bring Uriah back from battle and have him come home, spend the night with his wife. Okay, so she's pregnant. People will think that it's her child or his child, and, but it didn't work. Uriah, Uriah didn't want to go home. He's a soldier and he's faithful who was commander-in-chief, and there was war going on, and he wanted to go back. And so David did what so many people did and what so many people do today. He committed another sin to cover his sin. He had Uriah killed. I'm leaving out a lot, I know, I, I know I am. But by the time you come to the end of this chapter, I have to think that David feels like he's pretty safe. He has to think that his sexual sin, it's a secret, and his murder, uh, no one's ever going to know. It was years ago I was talking with Dave Burnham. Some of you know who he is. 
Dave made a statement that I've never forgotten, and this was years ago. Dave said, truth and time walk hand in hand. Truth and time walk hand in hand. That's so true. But David didn't seem to know that. Didn't seem to understand it. You see, being a king or not, it really didn't matter. It, he thought his sin, he thought all of his sin was a secret. He'd never have to answer for it. He'd never have to answer to anyone for it. No one would know. No one would think less of him. He was free and clear. I sometimes wish that the Word of God had a little bit more detail here, maybe there, you know, a few places. I'd honestly like to know, did David sleep okay after all of that? Was he able to go to bed the, the next night and after that and after that? and that, Was he able to sleep like a baby? And and I wish the Word of God gave some of that information. And then maybe it does. Because you see, Bible scholars tend to believe that two of the Psalms deal with this period of time. Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. Maybe you remember that back a few weeks ago, I made the comment that the Psalms are not presented to us in chronological order in the Old Testament. But listen, listen to Psalm 32. David is writing about his own life. Listen to what he says. He said, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was upon me, my moisture is turned into the draught of summer. Seems to fit. I really don't have great idea in terms of how much time elapsed between chapter 11 and chapter 12. It has to be a number of months. I, I'm fairly comfortable in saying that. Because when we come to the end of chapter 11, Bathsheba has announced to David that she has had a baby boy. And that's verified in the middle of chapter 12. And again, from a cultural standpoint, from a non-biblical standpoint, you would think that David should be happy. Uriah is out of the way. His sins seem to be covered. He has a new baby, and no one is demonstrating outside of the palace door. Life should be good. But it wasn't. And we come to chapter 12, verse 1, things get worse for David. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds and on and on. Nathan the prophet has a story to tell. It's a metaphor, and it's about David. Well, really, Nathan the prophet didn't come just simply to tell a story. That wasn't his intent. He came to expose David's sin. And right away, David has to be thinking to himself, uh-oh, somebody knows here. Nathan does. Who else does? <laughs> and probably God does. You know, sometimes we think we fool God. I, doesn't make sense. No, Nathan didn't come just to tell a story or to expose sin. He came to tell David there was going to be consequence. And that seemed to be news to David. There's a brief statement in the Old Testament, Numbers 32, 23. That goes like this, be sure. 
your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin will find you out. Well, maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe not next week. Maybe not next year. Maybe it'll be an eternity, but be sure. Your sin will find you out. But David, either he didn't know that or he had forgotten that. And so in came this guy, Nathan, the prophet. I've got, I've got a story I want to tell you. I've got a message for you. God sent me in David's heart just sank. Turn with me to Psalm 51, if you will, please. Psalm 51. Again, David is writing. In Psalm 32... David wrote about himself before Nathan came. Psalm 51 is after David, after Nathan came. Psalm 51, verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. He pleads with God. In verses 2 and 3, he acknowledges his sin. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't try to excuse it. No attempt to make light of it. Verse 4, David writes, Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Well, obviously, Bathsheba was hurt. Obviously, Uriah was hurt. But it was God's standard that had been broken. As you read through this psalm, you may begin thinking, David is rambling. He's just rambling. No, he's not. He's pouring his heart out. He's begging God to make him clean, and he's begging God to make things right. And look at what he says in verse 12. He says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Restore the joy. David could remember what it used to be like long ago. He could remember the joy of the salvation that he had. He could remember the joy of serving the Lord. He could remember the joy of being where the Lord wanted him to be spiritually. Restore the joy. Restore the joy. I don't think David is talking about what he had before that night. I don't think David's talking about what he had a couple years ago, because I think, I think David lost that joy a long time ago. The joy. It's not just the feeling. It's not attached to circumstances. Jesus made the comment that if you follow him, you're going to be persecuted. But rejoice. There should be joy. The Apostle Paul, in prison, writes about joy. The writer of the book of Hebrews says that we are to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising his shame. Are you kidding me? You put the cross and joy together? Yes. 
joy. Joy flows not only from a proper and intimate fellowship with the Lord, but it flows from a heart of gratitude that you don't get over. The joy flows from the awareness of the great privilege we have in Jesus Christ. Joy flows from sensing the freshness of God's grace and his mercy, and we could go on and on and on. Joy. Chuck Swindoll, in his book, To Laugh Again, says, and I quote, he says, I know of no greater need today than the need for joy. Isn't that kind of surprising? I know of no greater need today than the need for joy. Nehemiah writes in Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Lose the joy, you lose the strength. Walter B. Knight, author, writes, the joy, joy is the flag that flies over the castle of our hearts, announcing that the king is in residence. <laughs> I like that. Joy is the flag that flies over the castle of our hearts, announcing that the king is in residence. Joy. Sin can cause us to lose that joy. Wandering away from the Lord can cause us to lose that joy. Getting too busy. You just get so busy. There's so many responsibilities, so many things that you've got to do. And you lose the joy. Priorities get mixed. You lose focus. You lose appreciation. Joy. Moody Bible Institute, in one of their publications back a few years ago, said that there was a letter that was written by a man during the third century who knew that he was going to die. And he decided that before he died, he wanted to write a, a letter to his friend. This is what he wrote. He said, it's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are the Christians. And I am one of them. Joy. I asked my wife, Carolyn, to come this morning and play the piano. And she's going to play a song that I hope that we'll sing together during the invitation. I hope we'll all sing it together. I felt like I was singing a solo in the first service. Don't do that to yourselves. You've got to sing. It was a song that was written by William Kirkpatrick. I don't know all of the story, but Kirkpatrick was leading the music in what were called camp meetings. They were, they were like crusades. You don't even hear the terminology much today. But he was playing. He was leading the music. He didn't arrange for the soloist. I, I don't know how that happened, who, who got the soloist. Uh, but I'm really pretty sure that Kirkpatrick didn't get him. But every night of the meeting, he noticed that when the soloist got up 
to sing, and in he sang, but it just looked like something wasn't there. He was singing words, but something just wasn't there. And after he sang, the soloist always left. He never stayed to listen to the message. He, he sang, he was done, he left. Kirkpatrick worried about the soloist. And he went home one night after the meeting and he sat down and he began writing a song, this song that we're going to sing. He wrote a, a song, got it all together. The next morning, he found the soloist and he gave him the song, the words, the music. And, and he said, I want you to sing this song tonight. I don't know what you were planning on singing, whether you use this in the place of it or this along with but I want you to sing this song tonight. Well, the soloist obviously didn't know the song. It was just written the night before. So all day he's sitting down and he's going over the words over and over and over and over again. He's trying to learn the words. And that night when he got up to sing, he sang the words to this song. And then he sat down. He didn't leave. He sat down and he listened to the message. And when the invitation was given, he was the first one to move out and come forward to get his life right with the Lord. I wonder about you about where you're at, whether you know Christ, or whether if you do know him, whether you need to renew that commitment, whether you've lost the joy. Oh, Father, we're going to provide opportunity here just in a moment. We're going to sing this song. And Father, I invite those who today, they, they know there's need in their heart and their life. and They want to come today to receive the Lord Jesus Christ by faith into their heart, their life. Well, I pray, Father, if there's someone here who hasn't received Christ, that this would be the day they'd come. But maybe, Father, there are those here today who they know they're not what they used to be, and they've lost. And they want to renew their commitment to you. May they come. I'm going to stand here in front, and Father, I pray they'll come. It would be a joy to be able to meet with them and speak with them briefly. But may your spirit move in our midst and encourage us to make those decisions to be pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Won't you stand, please? If the Lord is speaking to you today, won't you come? As we sing together, come and join me. <clears throat> Oh. 
coming. Oh, Father, your arms are wide open. You love us so much. You so desire that those who have not come into relationship, those who have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, you so desire, so desire that they will come and receive the Lord Jesus. Do they receive salvation, forgiveness of sins? Sure, absolutely. But to be a part of your family, what joy. Father, but may we all examine our life. Where are we at? Are we where we were? Are we where we need to be? Are we where you want us to be? Encourage our hearts that direction. Now may God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one now forevermore till we meet again. Amen. Maranatha, God bless you.